You're very welcome back. Now, yesterday, President Vladimir Zelensky addressed a packed doll in Shannon, where he thanked Ireland for supporting Ukraine since this horrific war began. Joining us now with their take on the historic speech is Professor of Politics at DCU, Donoho Bachan, and Fine Gael TD, Jennifer Carroll McNeil. Jennifer, if I can come to you first, you were in the doll in the chamber for that speech. What was the atmosphere like? Uh, it was very intense and it was very serious. Um, I certainly felt there that I was there representing the people of Dunleary, who I know are working so hard to fundraise, to try to welcome Ukrainians into their schools, to try to make them make them feel at home and make the transition for the 18,000 people that have come nationally mm -hmm. to make it easier for them to, to be here in every way. So I certainly felt that it was a very important day to be there to represent them and what they're doing. But the address was very serious. I mean, he, he, he opened with what had happened last night, the attacks that had happened last night, and it immediately brings home to you the, the although we were there for a sense of um, a, an important day in the Dáil, mm. the reality of what he was dealing with that day, and when you think about what else he had to deal with yesterday, yeah. um, the sorts of briefings that he would have been getting, the places that he's visiting, the, the terrible, terrible information that he's getting all the time. Uh, it, it, it the really traumatic stuff he's seeing on a daily basis. Precisely, precisely. It really brings home quite how serious, quite how immediate, quite how urgent uh, what he's facing and, and what we're trying to do to support him from Ireland and support the Ukrainians who have come to Ireland as a matter of necessity, some of whom were there yesterday. He's yeah. uniquely gifted, isn't he, in his way of communicating mm. that to people. And he's using technology to connect in a way that has never been really used before, while, as you said, he's on the ground dealing with a horrendous war. It's, 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 it's very important for him to be able to do it, to connect with parliaments, to be able to have this programme of diplomacy, to tell the story. Uh, it's not just that we're seeing it through social media and through technology, we're seeing it through him, to tell the story of what's happening to his people, the atrocities that are being committed day on day. And it's, I mean, that's certainly the first address we've had from a president who is in war mm -hmm. uh, to, to speak to the Oireachtas. And it was really very sober and very serious yesterday. Now, from the Irish Parliament's perspective, you know, we tried to to respond collectively as a group. Roisin Garvey put out an email yesterday or last week saying, would we wear yellow and blue? So if there's any sense that he could see the parliament, that he could see and that we, we were there. And we could see in the yeah, so much yellow You know, symbols blue. matter. Symbols mm. matter in politics. And for him to see that back, to see that just that solidarity, isn't it the least that we could do? Yeah, yeah we can see the, the, the response by... The, by everybody in the room right there as well. But Donica, in terms of... I mean, it was such a significant moment. So you think of previous political leaders to address it all. You think of JFK, Nelson Mandela, Bill Clinton. So, but I mean, this is a completely different address. I mean, how was his speech interpreted? I think it was far more significant for Ireland than it was for President Zelensky. Okay. I mean, President Zelensky is addressing national parliaments almost on a daily basis, yeah. and there is a certain kind of format. This is an important tool of foreign policy. I mean, he didn't mince his words, as Jennifer was saying. I mean, he got right down to business very quickly in, in discussing what's happening in his own country and making a clear plea, a plea for Ireland to be supportive in sanctions against Russia, uh, to be supportive of uh, the EU application. And he always tries to tailor-make those speeches, which are relatively short, yeah, yeah. you know, to... An, to to the local audience. So when he was speaking to the British, he mentioned Churchill in World War II. When he was speaking to the US Congress, he was talking about 9-11 in Pearl Harbor. When he was talking to the Japanese, he mentioned the threat of, 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 of the nuclear reactors mm -hmm. and, of course, Russia's nuclear threat against uh, um, Japan, uh, sorry, against Ukraine, because he knew that would resonate with Japanese. So, of course, when he was talking to the Irish, he used the, the term about hunger, hunger being used as a weapon yeah. uh, against and colonialism. Ukraine. And colonialism, well. yes. Yeah. Which was something I think that would really resonate mm. with the Irish public and also the Dáil, the Shannon. So what was he looking for from the Irish people? He was looking for a continuation of the support that was already being given. I mean, he acknowledged, uh, you know, with gratitude, the support that Ireland had given from does day one. More, does he want more? He, well, he, he wants more of the same and, and, and I guess an enhanced support, uh, essentially within the European Union in particular, mm -hmm. to take a leadership role within the European Union in pushing for the strongest possible sanctions. The, the statistic was put out there yesterday that, you know, the EU has given uh, Ukraine one billion in aid since the war began, but they've given 35 billion to Russia in revenues from oil and gas. Wow. And, and that puts things in perspective. And that's what he's trying to highlight, that, you know, it's, it's, it's not just about, you know, uh, you know supporting Ukraine uh, on, on a rhetorical level. It's also about, you know, taking, uh, you know, taking it to Russia. And, and, and economic sanctions are at the fore of that.
What can we do, though, Jennifer? We are a small country in Europe. I suppose with Brexit, we came to the forefront and it felt like we were getting loads of support because other European countries had a, had a point to prove, and we did too. But what can we actually achieve in Europe? Quite a lot. You know, we still remain an equal partner at the European Council. We, uh, Simon Coveney has stated his support for very strong sanctions on oil and gas, you know, and we do act best in Europe when we act with unity. That is the strength. Mm. But that doesn't mean that we can't, as a country, and we are are doing this advocate for tougher and tougher sanctions uh, all the way through. I think you know they will announce I think now the seventh package of package of sanctions very shortly, and it gets tougher and tougher. And again, this is the tool that is the alternative to military action. You know we don't want to see an escalation of conflict. We need to talk about a de-escalation of mm. conflict. That's the only thing that's going to save lives tonight, tomorrow, the next day is to try to de-escalate conflict. But what the European Union can do, and I believe should do, is go a lot further in terms of sanctions on oil and gas. That that's not without cost to us and we have yeah. to recognise and acknowledge that yeah. but we are de living in a different world order now and the decisions that we have to make and what we have to think about are different and we and, and we need to be aware of that. But, well because as you say if we put tougher sanctions on and you're talking about was a 35 billion being given over to Russia if this hits the Irish people in the pocket like it already is hitting it you know where do where do the Irish but can the government really afford to do that? Well, you know, we're, the questions that we have to ask ourselves now are different. We're dealing with a land war in Europe and the obliteration of cities. What he said yesterday, what Zelensky said yesterday was there was 500,000 homes just wiped out in Mariupol. Mm. They're literally mapping where the bodies are for people to find it later. That's the reality of what's happening there and, but, and happening because of Russia. So our, the questions that we have to ask ourselves now are different. And that's also going to be the case as we welcome more and more Ukrainians who are fleeing that situation into Ireland. We want to provide supports to them. We don't know how long that's going to last. Many people will want to go home, but people will want to stay. We're trying to create structures where they can work, have their qualifications recognised. But that could go on for quite a while. Irish people have reacted with huge humanitarian openness and kindness. Mm. Um, but the questions that we ask ourselves now in Europe are different yeah. and will remain different. Zonacha, coming to you, looking at Kiev, we're now unbelievably six weeks into this war. Um, uh, withdrawal of Russian troops from Kiev. It seems like Putin's strategy is changing and focusing more on the Donbass region. What's your reading of that? Yeah, I mean, they, they were hoping for a blitzkrieg and to decapitate the Ukrainian government mm. uh, within the first few days. That hasn't worked. So this isn't, as the Russians portrayed it, as a, a withdrawal to generate goodwill. This is a retreat. They lost seven generals and 15,000 troops in five weeks. That was, that was unsustainable. But what we've seen is that these aren't normal battlefields. These are crime scenes that, that are being left behind and, and it's now imperative on, on the international community to document what has happened and what is happening in Ukraine and that those responsible are punished. This is vital. But in terms of the, the, the present danger, uh, we've seen by what, what, what is left behind from those areas around Kiev uh, what Russian troops are doing and, and it seems now that they're concentrating their efforts on the southeast of Ukraine around Donbass and the Ukrainian government is asking people to leave. Uh, and that means, I think, that there's going to be a major escalation in the, in, in the near future as, as Russia tries to consolidate its control of that part. And we've seen in Mariupol, which is in the Donetsk region, what people can look forward to. I mean, this is a medieval type of, of, mm. of warfare where people are being deprived of water, of electricity, of heating. Mm. Uh, Mariupol, I mean, I, I know the region very well. I mean, it was a city of half a million people before uh, the war broke out. Now it's down to about 120,000 people. There's not a single building that hasn't been damaged or destroyed. Yeah, Donica, just really briefly, Vladimir Zelensky was asking for Ireland to try and push for Ukraine to become a member of EU. Do you think that is possible? Oh, it is possible, yes. Do I you think it could happen it sooner could happen. rather than later? Because I mean, that's something obviously Vladimir Putin does not want. It's, it's something, and it would be more subversive to, to the Kremlin's narrative than NATO membership, because NATO membership just yeah. provides a security guarantee, but the EU is a much deeper relationship with the country, culturally, politically, economically. Uh, you know, economically. It's value-based. And a Ukraine that's prosperous, stable and democratic within the European Union would be a beacon, I think, to, to Russians who take a very, very active interest in Ukraine, and they would see that this is something that perhaps they would be interested as well in the future. Yeah, really, really interesting. Mr. Donico back on, a, a Professor of Politics at DCU and Finnegan. TD Jennifer Carol McNeil, thank you so much you. for joining thank us you. this morning. That